Hello, podcast listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of the Commercial Connection Podcast. I am your host, Spencer Taylor, with Milk Creek Commercial, and I am so excited to share this episode with you. Um, it's a webinar we did about two weeks ago on lobbying to help preserve 1031 exchanges. We are joined by um, a member of Senator Mike Lee's uh, staff and Mitt Romney staff, as well as Lou Kramer from Colliers International, a uh, DC insider himself, and Julie Baird. Julie Baird is an, is an exchange accommodator with First American Exchange and the president of the Federation of Exchange Accommodators, an organization dedicated to the uh, training and education of 1031 accommodators across the country. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. This is, I, I believe this is one of the most impactful webinars we've ever done. And I think a nugget that I took away is that every single one of us can influence the outcome of this by reaching out to our elected officials and voicing our opinion. And I invite you to do so. I'm, I'm sharing the link uh, to the uh, uh, 1031 uh, buildsamerica.org website in uh, in the in the notes of this uh, episode. Hope you enjoy it. Please, please, please give us a give us a rating if you like it. Give us a five star rating, and we invite you to share it with your friends. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you all, and welcome to another Mill Creek webinar. Um, we have an absolutely awesome presentation today. We are going to discuss in real time with some of the greatest Washington insiders, uh, 1031 exchange tax law and other uh, implications of commercial real estate uh, tax law. We have hosting our, our uh, seminar today, our real-time lobbying session. Um, I'm gonna tell a quick story in introducing him. I'm gonna be really, really quick about it, right? When we paid Lou Kramer to come over to Collier's from the World Trade Center, to be my friend, uh, and we were partners, but you know, I have to pay people to be my friend. I went to a, I went to a uh, hosted um, event on his behalf, and there was a, a Washington insider there who told me, he said, you do know Lou Kramer is the president of the largest Kabul in Washington, DC. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh yeah, all this stuff about insiders and, and secret combinations, it, it, it's real. And the largest one is known as FOL. And I'm like, FOL, what in the heck is FOL? He's like, friends of Lou. If you are a friend of Lou, you get in to see congressmen and their aides and, and policymakers like that, where the rest of us have to wait in line out in the hallway, uh, but Lou just walks by people. So Lou was, um, uh, he has a very, very long and, and, honorable career in business and politics and, and law. Uh, he goes way back with almost everybody. He can make a connection. Uh, he spent uh, a year in the Reagan White House as a White House fellow. And then he became uh, director general of the U.S. Foreign Services on a recess appointment in the Bush administration. He was a co-founder of the Pacific Trade uh, something sets on the board of the World Trade Center International. He is a K Street insider of the nth degree. Uh, spent a lot of years as a lobbyist on DC in DC until our good friend John Huntsman was governor of Utah, and he brought him home to start the first landlocked World Trade Center. And Lou was a hit. And then we paid him to come over to Collier's and be my friend. And now uh, I'm turning the rest of the time over to. The uh, Grand Poobah of FOL, Washington, D.C. chapter, Mr. Lou Kramer. I am so embarrassed, but thank you, Kevin, for those very kind words. Uh, some of them were actually true, but my job today is to welcome all of you and find ways to keep America prosperous and wealth together. And, and I appreciate so much our, our Washington uh, 
next generation of political servants joining us today. Thank you for being here today and uh, for hearing. I know that uh, we were on a webinar yesterday with Senator Romney. I know that everyone's in the middle of the infrastructure uh, uh, deliberations, and they're trying to find ways to pay for this. And our story today is please don't use 1031 as a a so-called tax uh, fix for this because it's not. And so with Kevin's kind words, let me introduce in the following order. This is how we intend to proceed. Um, Julie Baird is the president of First American Exchange Company, which is the national, a nationally qualified intermediary owned by First American uh, Title Insurance Company. And she is the current president of the Federation of uh, Exchange Accommodators. This is a big deal to make 1031s work. Following that, my dear friend Kevin, who is now my friend because he said such nice things about me, is going to give some real case studies about real people whose real lives across the board are affected by this. Not just, you know, the Jeff Bezos and the Bill Gates of the world, but middle America that are core for our economic foundation going forward. Following that, we will ask for your questions, comments, and ideas that we can share with an a plus group of Washington, we'll call them insiders. We don't want to embarrass them by that because their mothers may think they do other things for a living. But uh, Rob, Rob Axon has been a longtime friend of both me and working for Senator Lee for uh, a dozen years. Uh, he is, if, if I walk into an event in, in Salt Lake and Rob's not there, I just walk out. It's just not worth my time because it's not where I want to be because where Rob is, good things happen. And uh, I, uh, We'll, we'll leave it at that. I don't want to embarrass him such as I've been embarrassed. Uh, we are also uh, pleased to have Mandy Grant, who works for Senator Romney on business uh, outreach opportunities. And if this were not a business outreach opportunity to the ninth, ninth, nth degree, I don't know what it is. So, Mandy, thank you in the midst of all. I'm sure you're getting a, 100 phone calls an hour. So thank you for taking the time. We will also be ha- uh, pleased to have uh, Dr. John Shelton, who is Senator Lee's tax expert. I've had the pleasure of talking to, to John a couple times about real estate related tax. He is very smart and uh, uh, he's worked for several other legislators. Uh, so he knows how Washington DC works. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This, this is exciting, but it's only exciting because we're fighting for the, the right and uh, the good and the things that keep America great. So with that, Julie, if you'd be so kind, she's based in Denver, lives in Moab, the best of both worlds. Denver uh, business and uh, Utah voting privileges. Turning over to Julie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lou. Thanks for that introduction. And Rob, Mandy, and John, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all this morning and everyone on the webinar as well. There are several tax provisions proposed as part of the American Families Plan that really could dramatically impact the commercial real estate market. And Kevin's going to touch on a bunch of these later. Um, But this morning, my focus is really going to be on this proposed cap on the amount of gain that can be deferred under Section 1031. And I do have a couple of slides, so bear with me for one second here while I pull my screen up. All right, I believe you all should now be able to see um, this slide in front of you that has really the the only text we know so far for this proposal. You'll see it there in bold. Um, We do know this proposed cap is 500,000. There's some language uh, in the green book that indicates that the limit for married couples filing jointly would be a million. Also take note of this proposed effective date. This effective date um, would be for exchanges completed starting in 2022. And that's important to note because folks that start their exchanges later this year, but don't complete them until next year could potentially be subjected to this cap. So the FEA, along with our coalition partners funded two really important economic studies. And um, again, bear with me here while I maneuver the slides. And these economics, uh, economic studies evaluate, evaluated the micro and macro economic impacts um, of 1031. And I'm gonna walk through, uh, through of the conclusions of these studies that I think are really illustrative of the impact of 1031 exchanges on the real estate market. And I really wanna express my gratitude to my colleagues on the FEA Government Affairs Committee and particularly to Suzanne Goldstein Baker for distilling these pretty complicated studies into the following really digestible highlights. And I think what you'll see here pretty clearly by the end of these slides is that the administration's proposed $500,000 cap on 1031 is really an ineffective pay for to meet the objectives of the American Families Plan. 
So our two studies here are the Ling and Petrova and Ernst and Young studies. Ling Petrova updated their study in October of last year. This is the microeconomic study that focuses on commercial real estate. And EY updated their study earlier this year in May. And this is the macroeconomic study that focuses on direct and indirect economic activity generated by exchanges. So let's start with Ling and Petrova. So this Ling and Petrova microeconomic study focused on a 10 year period of time. So 2010 to 2020, and it examined data from CoStar, NAR, Marcus and Millichap and a large national qualified intermediary. This study concluded that 10 to 20% of all commercial real estate transactions are 1031 exchanges. And really this estimate is low. So it is very difficult to track exchange transactions because there's no information that's required to be placed on the recordable documents. So this is really an estimate based on the data that these folks were able to collect. And again, this estimate of 10 to 20% is likely on the low end. The results show that exchanges preserve capital and encourage capital improvements, which in turn create jobs and add to the state and local tax bases. It concluded that there's greater investment with 1031 exchange buyers. So these 1031 exchange buyers invest more capital, over 15% more capital compared to non-1031 buyers going into their replacement properties. Exchange acquisitions are associated with greater equity and lower leverage. So this reduces credit risk to investors and lenders and really adds to overall stability in the marketplace. Exchanges encourage shorter holding periods, and this improves market marketability and liquidity in the commercial real estate market. The study found that 38% of all commercial real estate exchanges are multifamily housing, and that's important as we get later here on the slide when we talk about rent increases of 6%. The study found that nationally half of all exchanges are valued up above that 500,000 mark, in fact, up over $575,000. The study also found that the vast majority of 1031 exchanges are one-time events followed by a taxable sale. This is a really important data point because this finding really shows that this, this myth that investors swap till they drop really just isn't true. The fact is that the overwhelming majority of exchanges are one-time events followed by a taxable sale. And this also really highlights that 1031 is a deferral tool. It's really a timing tool for our clients and for investors. It is not a tax avoidance tool. The study showed that elimination of exchanges would cause a decrease in transaction activity, capital investment, and real estate prices, so a decrease to the tune of about 6%. And then the study found the converse side of that, an increase in holding periods, increase in cost of capital, increase in leverage, and an increase in rents to the tune of 6%. And remember, 38% of the transactions were multifamily housing, so that rent increase is, is really significant. The study also found that 63% of tax deferral is actually recovered by the treasury through the reduced depreciation dedu deductions. And this happens because an investor's depreciation schedule does not restart. When they exchange into replacement property, they are locked into the depreciation that they've already taken on the relinquished property. And I know Kevin is gonna touch a little bit more on this when he shares some of his examples. All right, switching gears for just a moment now, we're going to click over to the EY macroeconomic impact study. And again, this study measured direct and indirect uh, impact on economic activity. So it really looked at exchanging taxpayer businesses, supplier businesses, and related consumer spending. This study concluded that exchanges reduce the cost of capital, increase investment in the economy, generate jobs, Exchanges remove the lock-in effect with real estate, which promotes the highest and best use of properties, and they encourage the most efficient deployment of capital and efficient business growth. These are so important in our post-pandemic economic recovery. There are a lot of real estate assets that are gonna need to be repurposed to sort of face post-pandemic challenge challenges, and 1031 exchanges really provide a critical tool to allow those transitions to happen. So let's take a look at the numbers. These numbers are pretty dramatic. The EY study showed that in 2021, so this year, 1031 exchange activity will support the creation of 568,000 jobs. Additionally, $27.5 billion of labor income and over $55 billion of value totally added to the US economy. These numbers are based on that 10 to 20% number that we were talking about earlier. So remember that estimate is low. So the EY study went a step further and said, because that, that estimate of activity is likely underestimated, the exchanges may actually support up to 710,000 jobs 
over $34 billion of labor income and over $69 billion of value added to the US economy. In addition, exchanges contribute to the federal, state, and local tax revenue, almost $8 billion in federal, state, and local taxes. And then again, that depreciation issue we were talking about, $6 billion a year of additional income taxes due to that foregone depreciation. These numbers are really significant and they really far outweigh the estimated $1.95 billion of revenue that Treasury is estimated would be provided by this proposed cap. So again, this is really compelling national data. And I just wanted to conclude quickly by giving you some very brief information for Utah specifically. The FEA collected data, um, 1031 exchange transaction data from six qualified intermediaries who facilitated exchanges for a five-year period of time. So this is 2015 through 2019. The aggregate value of those transactions for just Utah was more than $1.9 billion. And remember, this is just six QIs, so really just a fraction of overall transaction activity. This data really shows the impact of 1031 exchanges on the Utah real estate market, and also is a great example of how these really large national numbers do translate down on a local level. So thanks again for this opportunity to share this data, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And now, Kevin, I'd like to, to turn it back to you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, and um, thank you so much, uh, Mandy and Robert uh, and John for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. My, uh, my position, I've created a company called Mill Creek Commercial, and we are the largest purveyor uh, in the United States of fractional ownership of high quality commercial real estate. So what we do is we buy a CVS pharmacy. Now, most Americans can't afford $6 million for a CVS pharmacy because they're coming out of, they built up the duplex next door to them. They took care of it their whole life. They've dealt with the tenants trash and, and all that stuff. And now they want to get out of it. Uh, and so they 1031 exchange often in their waning years into maybe 10% of a of a CVS pharmacy. And that's the product that we provide. We do, we do um, tons of 1031 exchanges every year. One important factor, the transaction coming in to our property is tax deferred by the person coming in. The fund that I manage that buys these properties and resells them has a taxable event at every one of these sales not going into the millions of dollars we pay in taxes every year, but most 1031 exchanges are only exchanged on one end of the event. The, the seller or perhaps the buyer is not exchanging. They're in a taxable event. I actually asked Julie how, what percentage, and she says way less than 50% are both sides in a 1031 exchange. So that was uh, just a, an interesting aside there. I'm going to go into kind of a, a wonky Utah specific discussion. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and uh, I got a staff member here who's going to share my screen for me. Um, and we're going to walk through. Uh, here we go. There it is right down there. OK. OK. Okay, so these are two statues. I, I know that Rob uh, recognizes the one on the left. Um, and maybe Mandy can tell me where the one on the right is. Um, but uh, the one on the right is at the Utah State Capitol. And what these two people have in common is, no, they're not both Broadway singing stars, but they are the father and the grandfather of our monetary system and our investment system in the United States. Mariner Eccles, a Utahan, was the, the father of our modern monetary system. A wonderful, uh, intelligent individual who set that up or was instrumental in setting it up and his statue is at the Utah State Capitol. Um, a descendant of his, Randy Quarles. I'm sure that all the Washington insiders know Randy. Randy's currently vice chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, Lou and I uh, have put together many events and Randy Quarles was a key speaker at one of our events. And uh, he, he spoke in such wonky language that most of us 
commercial real estate agents just went, Woo, that's over our head, right? But there was one, there, there were a couple of points, I'm not gonna touch on the second one, but the first point that he made that really landed with me is that um, the strength of the Western world, the United States financial system is consistency consistency. We know what we're investing in. We know what our returns essentially are going to be. Tax rates are going to be adjusted. We deal with that, but we don't take 120 degree turns on the, on the shift. He actually referred in that talk to that the last time there was a major shift in the keel of our boat was back when my friends, Oregon Senators Bob Packwood and Mark Hatfield, uh, pushed through the, the Reagan administration tax changes. Uh, so it's been a long time. And investors are very comfortable. We know what we're investing in. We know how we're moving forward. And that's our strength. So until the American Families Plan was uh, at least volleyed out there as a proposal, uh, this represents the largest change uh, in American investment policy in years, uh, 50 years probably. Uh, it affects three sections of tax code. We're going to focus on 1031, but of course it affects 1222, which is just tax rates in general. Um, and then uh, 1031, which is the ability to defer taxes. And then 1014, uh, which affects uh, uh, Julie referred to it as swap until you drop. Uh, it's an interesting policy of uh, being able to move up your basis. Uh, that's, a, that's a very personal American aspect uh, that's, that we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but th these are all major real estate investment issues uh, in front of you. Of course, uh, 1031 tax rate uh, or 1222 affects tax rates. It, it affects uh, the capital gains rate. And the bad assumption that is made, John, is that, and, and I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this, is that stagnant, that, that transactions are stagnant. If you increase a capital gains tax rate, the same number of transactions are gonna happen. No, they're not. We, we as business people make pencil decisions based on, on how much our bottom line is, and we just dial back. And this chart here shows how every time we raise the federal capital gain, we decrease income to the federal government. Um, and that's a, an accepted Washington DC principle. Uh, but the same thing impacts 1031 exchange. Every 1031 exchange transaction is a, dis is a transaction of choice. I choose to do it because I can defer my taxes. If I can't defer my taxes, I'll just stay in the property I'm in. There's no need to move. I'm not gonna pay 30% of my capital gains or 42% of my capital gains. I'll just keep them. Why, why do the transaction if I can't defer the taxes? So we can't take a linear, which is what, what uh, some in Washington DC wanna say, well, right now there are $1.6 trillion deferred we, if, if we stop allowing these deferrals to happen, those same transactions will occur and we will bring that $1.6 trillion into the federal coffers. No, the transactions won't occur. People will simply hold on to their property and, and not move. There will be five unintended consequences of, of significantly hampering 1031 exchange. These are, these are unintended uh, consequences that are very serious. One is it's going to diminish the quality of rental housing because at every exchange I've ever been involved in, in multifamily, the new person comes in, brings in a new, uh, new equity, a new depreciation schedule, a new vision, and, and the bank requires him to make changes at the transaction. And so he upgrades the rental stock. If because uh, the 1031 Exeter is, has to pay taxes and he decides not to exit and not sell his property, that rental stock diminishes because that investor is typically 70 years old and he's getting old and he's putting as little money into that property as possible. And so it will show a diminished uh, uh, quality of, of middle class and lower middle class housing. It will effectuate urban suburban sprawl. 
So right now, a farmer in a high growth area, and if you're in Utah, there, there's a lot of that high growth area going on, right? We can go to a farmer and say, look, we want your family to continue farming. That's great. How about we trade you 200 acres out in Genola for 75 acres here in Highland or Lehigh? Uh, and the farmer says, great, I'll do that. And he does that. He keeps farming out there. He trades his land. He doesn't have to pay taxes on it. He does a 231 exchange. And suburban growth can go in an organized path through, uh, through an area, right? When you don't have 1031 exchange as a tool to do that, that farmer says, oh, wait a minute, I'm not done farming. I don't want to sell my property, take cash, pay taxes to the government. I, I have no interest in that. You've all met that farmer, right? Um, and so he's just going to say, I'm not going to sell. And that's going to require a checkerboard in development across the United States where we have to dance around. And, and, and you think that the money we just put into infrastructure, the, the money that would have to go into suburban infrastructure to support that frogging around would be unbelievable. Um, and it would raise the cost of entry level housing because it is mostly entry level housing that is out in these growth areas. And if it's more expensive to get the ground, it's going to be more expensive to build those houses. And if, if we're going to take 30% of the income from the farmer of what we sell him because we don't allow him to defer those taxes, that's a price increase that's going to effectuate through to those houses. Uh, we're going to have a decreased quality of life for our senior community. I'm going to show you an illustration of that uh, one on one American families plan on this side and over on the, on the other side. We're going to look at current person and how they can build wealth in 1031 exchanges and surprisingly, and I would love to have a more lengthy discussion with you, John, about this uh, changes to 1031 exchange law will significantly decrease federal revenues um, because of uh, some stuff I'm, we're going to discuss here shortly. Um, I'm going to skip talking about 10, uh, Section 1014, which is step up in basis because we don't have time for that. But a question of, of you three, who thinks a Roth IRA, or anybody on this uh, thing, who thinks a Roth IRA is bad or, or a Roth 401k? Nobody does. It's a great wealth building tool for Americans. Why does Congress think 1031 exchange is of the devil? They are the same thing. A Roth IRA, 401k, our initial investment is with tax dollars. We're able to trade stocks without paying taxes on our gains. When we sell the stock and we take the income, we pay the tax. And it's a great wealth, personal wealth building tool for American retirement. 1031 exchange is the same tool used for real estate. Initial investment, tax dollars. You're able to trade real estate without paying taxes on the gains until you sell the property, take the income and pay the taxes. And I am gonna defer back to 1014 just for a second. As Julie pointed out, there is less than 20% of transactions that do not come to a taxable event. There are people, Robert and I know of a family who, who like, because Robert grew up in the same neighborhood where I raised my children and we went to high school Lone Peak nights right, uh, together, right? Robert went on, made a name for himself, became a Washington DC insider, that's awesome. There's one family who chose to work the family farm and, and stay in the grounds and, and like they still have the, the Garrett family farm right between kind of where Robert grew up and where I raised my children and it's still there, right? So, and, and it's still growing. Everything's gone around it, but, they're, but they've kept that family farm. At some point in time, uh, bless their hearts, the Garrett family's gonna, the, the, the generation that's my age is gonna pass away and they're gonna go down to Reggie uh, and, and, the, and your generation, right? And we're gonna go to them and say, oh, hey, this is a personal conversation, Robert, you can have, right? Hey, uh, hey, Reggie, um, you know, the, the 20 acres uh, behind our house, where we grew up? well, yeah, your parents have passed away and uh, you need to give me 43 of those 100 acres because, you know, Washington, D.C. needs those. 
and there is no step up in basis. And yeah, I know you've worked them your whole life and you really thought they were yours, but they really belong to the government. That's where the step up in basis comes into effect. It's a very personal thing for families, especially rural families. So I, I wasn't gonna go there, but I did, I'm sorry. Um, I wanna wrap up with uh, an example of a made up client, but this is somebody I deal with every day. This is somebody every one of you guys know. He's 35 years old, he has a family, and he has $100,000. He saved that money up, he made some good investments. Wall Street got a bonus, his dad died, whatever, right? He's got $100,000. He comes to a real estate professional and he says, what do I do? The real estate professional, both under the American Families Plan and the current tax structure say to him, invest in real estate. Leverage into a $400,000 single family home, we're gonna start renting it because there are tons of great tax advantages to owning real estate. So you're gonna, ta you're gonna shield your gains with depreciation and you're, not gonna, you're gonna make money, you're gonna, you're gonna run this and you're not gonna pay any taxes and you're gonna be able to write stuff off, it's gonna be really beneficial and so that's great. And so seven years go by and this guy is, is living the life. Uh, and then uh, he comes uh, to after seven years, he comes under the current tax structure. Now under, if we eliminate 1031 exchange, this policy says this guy just sets pat. He just keeps owning the property. But in seven years, he sells the property for $540,000. He has been smart enough to pour all of his money into his equity. So he's bought down his loan. So he buys a $1.1 $1 .1 million piece of property and he pays transactional costs into the economy of $32,000. Um, and those taxes, those are service or people like Julie and myself, they get taxed, right? So then um, another seven years go by, year 14 comes along, our American Family Plan guy keeps paying no taxes. This is awesome. He loves owning his real estate. He tinkers on it. He does stuff, but he, you know, he, that's great. But our, but our current tax guy goes back to his real estate professional and his exchange accommodator because he uses Julie and she's so freaking awesome. It's, a, it's amazing. And he does another 1031 exchange. He sells his property for $1.5 million and he leverages into a $3.2 million property. Now there's an important aspect. Julie touched on this. There is a penalty for when you 1031 exchange. You have to maintain your existing basis. So this gentleman is dealing with a basis on a $400,000 property for his tax depreciation. So now he's not completely sheltered in income. And so he spent years eight through 14 uh, having $1,200 a year in income that he's actually having to pay tax on, uh, even though he's making more money, he's paying tax on about 1,200. Um, he has transactional costs of nearly $100,000. Julie and I pay taxes on those transactional costs. Um, and and he, he, go, he leverages into a $3 million property. He goes another seven years. Uh, during this period of seven years, because he's had to maintain his basis, he's now showing income off this property of 20, over $26,000 a year. He's having to pay income tax on that, right? And so now he sells the property for $4.3 million, defers the taxes again, and he leverages into a $9 million piece of property, and he pays transactional costs of $258,000. Now, our guy over here in the American Families Plan, because the American Families Plan said, we got to stop people from cheating the government out of taxes and getting being successful, he still owns his property. He still is not paying any taxes on it because he's still depreciating it. He's still tinkering at it. He's working, he's painting it, he's retenanting it. He's doing that. He's happy because he doesn't know any different. And he doesn't have this vehicle, but he's, he's doing well over there, okay? So, you know, he, he's living in his universe. We move on. Now, our, now the guy that owns the $10 million property, uh, let's just say he's me. He's now like 60 years old. He spends all his life on the golf course. It's like, great, because I, I have professional managers. I pay these fees. It's awesome, right? But now it comes to the point, it's now been 28 years. I'm approaching 70 years old, 65 years old. My wife is saying, look, I am done I, with you just golfing and do so. I, I want to move to the Bahamas, whatever. I, I want to do something different. So let's get out of this real estate. Both of them decide that. It's time to move on, right? So our current tax structure gentleman 
has during the years 22 through 28, he's has taxable gain that he's paying tax to pay Washington DC fees down there, right? Of almost a hundred thousand dollars a year. That's how successful he's become. Our American family's playing guy. He's happy. He's not paying any taxes. He's, he's just like, ah, this is really cool, right? So now we have the exit. It's time to retire. The exit. Our American family's playing guy. He sells his property. It has appreciated to nearly a million dollars. Remember, he only paid 400000 He leveraged into it. That's awesome. He took $100,000, turned it into almost a million dollars. That's great. He pays his transactional costs one time, $57,000. And he pays to the federal government now all that uh, depreciation recapture and all his capital gains. He pays one time $323,000 in taxes. And he has about a $600,000 retirement egg that he, he's happy. That's great, right? But our 1031 exchange guy over here under the current tax structure, he decides to sell out at 12 million, pays off his debts, et cetera, pays taxes of 3 million, 200 and taxes, not, not money on taxes, pays capital gains and depreciation recapture, all these deferred taxes over the year that he built up, he now pays them. $3.25 million in taxes. He has transactional costs of $731,000 in this transaction. And the likes of Julie and I pay taxes on that. Just so that we summarize, right? Over the, over the time, you can see on the right side what our American Families Plan guy paid to the federal government. $323,000. Uh, he paid no income tax at all. And he paid transactional costs of $57,000. That's what, that's what the American Families Plan that is put forth to generate revenue to offset infrastructure, that's what this guy just did under the American Families Plan. Now, our person over here who followed the advice of Julie, he pays $3.64 million in capital gains taxes in both state and federal, right? Over the years, he has paid $882,000 of income, taxes on that income. Uh, and uh, for, you know, his, his total taxes over this 28 year period is in, well in excess of $3.7 million. $3.7 million, $350,000. Ten thirty one exchange law currently increases, improves lifestyles. So our American families plan because we don't want people to. I, I don't know what we want, but they're living this retirement lifestyle, and our person who has taken an aggressive ten thirty one exchange law our uh, uh, strategy is living that retirement lifestyle. That's what current law affords the American middle-class person. There are many of them that take advantage of this and they pay 10 times more in taxes to the federal government during that 28 year period than the person who's restricted from doing it. Thank you for your time. Uh, I spoke way too long, I'm sorry. Lou, take it over and get this thing under control. Boy, if you were only passionate about this, Kevin, we'd understand your position. Thank you both, very helpful. Uh, we have questions coming in. Uh, would it be useful, uh, Robert, uh, Mandy, John, just a, a response to any of this or should we wait till the questions come in given the time? Probably. Yeah, just dive right in. Uh, we're good answering as many questions as possible and adding Great. to the conversation. That was really insightful. I mean, to see numbers and examples. Thank you, Julie and Kevin. And, uh, and may, may I just say, I think from what I see as a commercial real estate executive, the number of 1031s is much higher in Utah than 10, 15, 20%. I mean, it is relentless. And there's big dollars reflecting the kinds of things that Kevin and Julie have talked about that will eventually be paid to the Treasury. But in the interim, they are doing all those things. And I again, thank Robert bringing to my attention the fact that you know, the rental properties finally get upgraded every time they change. Without it, that's not going to happen. So why don't we, Spencer, you, the, you've got the microphone on uh, these questions coming in. You're, you're muted at the moment, but why don't you share some of the basics and see where we go? 
thank you, Lou, and thank you, everyone. Uh, just as a quick reminder to, to all of our participants, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions, and we think we'll be able to get to all of them. The first one comes from Paul. He says, as a member of the National Association of, of Realtors, we meet each year with our senators and Congress people in DC to discuss real estate issues. Every year, 1031 exchanges are discussed because it is always a subject of conversation in the tax code and potentially removing it. Do you folks communicate with NAR or National Association of Realtors leadership regarding 1031 exchanges? How about our Washington folks? You hear the NAR folks, they're, they're relentless, good people. Any updates on that? I do know that uh, we're gonna continue to, to coordinate and collaborate with them. Yeah, I'll jump in real quick, uh, and then John and, and Mandy can add their perspective. Um, we are in regular contact, even here. So I'm based in the Senator's Utah office. Uh, and even here in the state, we have regular contact with the Utah Association of Realtors and some of the national representatives, as well as some of the various county and local uh, Association of Realtor representatives. During my time earlier in Senator Lee's uh, terms of service, uh, I was in DC and, and again, met with uh, folks regular there, regularly there. Uh, and we find the conversations very helpful, just like this conversation today is. What happens is everybody uh, has your, your skill set. You have your wheelhouse where you dive deep. And even though we have to be pretty well versed on, on a host of issues, and especially those issues that are coming before the senators to, uh, to elicit their uh, approval or, or opinion and, and go through the committee process or even come to the floor, we very much benefit from people who live day in and day out working professionally on these issues. And so that's where I, I would encourage folks as you're thinking of how to engage with your congressional representatives, whether they're Senators Lee and, and Romney here in Utah, or you're in a different state and you have uh, your senators there that you need to engage with, as well as your, your congressional office. Make sure that you have this regular conversation and, and relationship that you're building. Just because you had a conversation with us about a 1031 exchange and the, the interest that you have on that a year ago or two years ago or three years ago, even though Senator Lee's position may not have changed, in this case, you know, very supportive of, of the position that you all take, it still is very helpful for him and for us as his surrogates to get most uh, current information. The facts that you have both laid out, Julie and Kevin, in your presentation is relevant today. And it's certainly the, the principles are gonna be relevant a year from now, two years from now, but the updated information from an Ernst & Young analysis or an, another report that you've put forward, getting that updated information gives us additional tools in our tool chest to, to fight the fight and make sure that Senator Lee and, and other congressional members uh, are able to articulate and advocate for those things that you guys care about. Herb, that's very helpful. And, and very wise, Robert has met with those folks over and over again and very graciously does that, but facts change, the law proposed changed, and so current updates matter. And it's somebody from Salt Lake going to Senator Lee is much more useful than somebody from you know, another state coming here, whereas uh, Julie ought to be talking in Colorado. I mean, we, we know how that works. All politics is local at the end of the day. Th thank you, Robert. Um, Julie, I was wondering if, could you just put a little flavor on um, the lobbying efforts that, that, that the Federation of Exchange Accommodators are doing? Kind of what's your strategy? How do you communicate with those on the Hill? And then just share a quick, um, just a quick thing on how someone uh, could participate in connecting with their elected officials. Yeah, thanks, Spencer. I'd be happy to. And I did just put in the chat a link to our advocacy website, which gives you the ability just by clicking on the take action button and entering your zip code, it will connect you directly to your elected officials. And it's got a pre-populated note regarding the importance of 1031 exchanges. So take a moment to do that when you are able. The FBA has been incredibly active on the lobbying front, um, gosh, for years now, starting with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and certainly through today, we probably are on Zoom calls with congressional leaders twice a week and have been since January. We are focused on democratic leadership 
um, on the uh, House Ways and Means Committee and then the Senate Finance Committee and just trying to make sure we're getting these economic studies in front of them so they can truly see the, the importance, like the value of these numbers, you know, economic uh, 1031 exchanges really are an economic driver. So we've been very active on that front. I mentioned a coalition when I was talking about the funding of those studies. NAR, as we were just talking about, has been incredibly active as part of that coalition. They're, they have so many boots on the ground. They've been great with some of our local PR activities as well, finding local leaders to co-write opinion pieces in some key congressional districts. Uh, so we have a very sophisticated lobbying machine. Williams and Jensen and Dave Fernaziak uh, in DC are, are, is the lobbyist for FEA and he's been in the industry for years and really is driving the ship and doing an excellent job. Yeah. Thank you. Our, our next question comes from Alan. And Lou, you, you might be able to, to uh, best answer this. He, he asked, do you see Biden's plan, if passed, apply to retroactively, or will it apply from, let's say, 2022 forward, i.e., can we proceed with 1031 exchanges for the remainder of this year? Uh, may I just say, I, I lived through the 1986 tax changes that Kevin talked about as first, and we were very careful to ensure that the effective dates were not, uh, you know, just not a cliff because we had had problems in the past where uh, I'm old enough to remember what was happening in the 1970s when we, we passed bills and people were jumping off buildings because they were retroactive. That's, I cannot believe any scenario where that would happen. And uh, we have... We have enough wise, let's be candid, Republican senators who would not allow that to happen. And thank goodness for, uh, I, I looked at to my two beloved senators here in Utah, uh, they would you know, lay down in front of the tanks to, to not let that happen. So I, I believe that uh, you know, whether the courts or the, the Republican minority or whatever, that's not gonna happen. I'm speaking as somebody who's not counting votes, uh, which uh, Mandy, John, and Robert are doing, but uh, believe me, I'm speaking as somebody who's, set, we call it a bog sat, bunch of guys sitting around the table. I, I remember those conversations, and we just said we cannot make the same mistakes we made in the 1970s. So I hope that wisdom is transferred to your generation. I don't know uh, if our Washington ins insiders have comments, but I'm telling our clients, like to go ahead. Lou, I'd like to hear from John on that. Uh, yep. Is there a discussion? I, I did see something about uh, setting the tax rate, the capital oh, yeah. gains tax I rate. I know, I know. If they set it this month, that it's retroactive to the beginning of the year. Um, uh, but uh, what, what's going on at the box sats? A bunch so, of guys sitting around a table. <laughs> and women now. Sorry. <laughs> J John, Mandy? Yeah. So I was going to say, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, my job is not to predict uh, uh, President, President Biden's mind, nor would I be very good at it were it my, my job. Um, <laughs> but I think as we're one of the things that is, is crucial to this conversation is that if the 1031 exchanges, if they come, the, the, the um, cutback of that, um, that feature of our tax code is going to be paired with a capital gains rate increase. So, so now instead of having uh, long-term capital gains, you're going to have uh, taxation at that highest income margin. So 39.6, I believe, right? So with the net uh, investment income tax, you're going to have these exchanges going from, uh, you know, uh, completely offset to uh, for, you're going to be taxed at 43 point something percent. I'm not going to, is it 43.2? Yeah. I need to yeah. yeah. Right. But, but I mean, that's an insane overnight transformation. And whether it happens, you know, immediately upon enactment or if it's not till the end of the, the financial year, that's going to completely upend people's financial models. So, well, and I, the important thing that I would like Washington, D.C. to grasp is that 1031 exchange transactions are transactions of choice. We do them because we can defer our gain. If we can't defer our game, we wait until it's a transaction of need and I need the money, right? So I'll just wait. I'm not going to pay. I mean, I like you and Rob and, and I really like Mandy, but I'm not going to pay you 43%. Come on, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of going down this road of how, how the legislation is passed, Rick asks, Based upon the current divide in the Senate between Republicans and Democrats, I assume that any uh, tax law changes would 
have to take 60 votes to pass, right? Give us just kind of a quick overview of what needs to happen in Washington, D.C. for something like this to pass. I can jump in there. Sure, uh, John. Someone else wants to. So it just depends on how it moves. I, I, I believe this would be moving through uh, what we call budget reconciliation, uh, which is a vehicle that would allow these changes to be made with, with a simple majority of votes. So 50 votes plus uh, Vice President Harris's tie-breaking vote. Um, so it, it depends. And then there's some standards. So it, yeah, it depends what's in the reconciliation package. Certain amendments to that package, if they were included, could be at that same 51 vote threshold or it could be at a higher 60 vote threshold. It depends on the, the kind of arcana of, of Senate procedure, which is, is you know, these amendments into this legislation uh, pass the germaneness standard. Um, there's a lot of nuts and bolts to it, but you know, theoretically, uh, the, the the Biden proposal could be passed with just 50 Senate votes and and uh, Vice President Harris's tiebreak. So, uh, Bogsat Insider Info, is there an appetite among uh, the senator from Arizona and the senator from West Virginia to make these kinds of drastic changes to 1031 exchange law? They would seem to be the key senators, right? Um, do you have any insight with their staff? Is there a, uh, what, what, what do you think the likelihood of having 1031 exchange law changes included in a reconciliation? You know, something, I, I'll jump in real quick, John, uh, and okay. then you can talk about the likelihood that you see it going in reconciliation. But I think, Kevin, you've uh, nailed something that's very important, and that is to start where where there's kind of the fertile ground to have those conversations on the Democrat side. And, and I'm appreciative and glad that Julie has mentioned that they're working tirelessly to advocate for 1031 exchanges among Democrats uh, since January. I think that's a very important effort. Um, but in regard to Senator Cinema, I, I think identifying now early those issues that are specific and the facts that are specific about the benefits of 1031 exchanges in Arizona would be time well spent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And doing that now so that she has it and you've started to plant the seeds, they've started to take root. I think that would be very helpful. In uh, Senator Cinema's uh, regard. Her parents actually live in Lehigh. She grew up and spent time here in Utah, went to right. BYU. And so sharing with her the Utah perspective as well, I, I think adds additional um, benefit for her to understand the importance of this issue, especially as we have large growth areas here in the Intermountain West, uh, where a lot of folks coming from the coast and other big cities are coming to yeah. Utah. And, and certainly this transaction of real estate that occurs, as well as that, uh, you know, those old timers selling off their, their real estate and some of their um, agricultural lands like you've talked about, Kevin. I think these are very important conversations, not just in Utah, but in Arizona and time spent with her now on that would be very important. A benefit so, that we have with uh, Senator Romney and Senator Lee, I, I can't speak for Romney, but I assume he has a good relationship with, with Senator Cinema. Uh, obviously they're working closely together on, on some of their efforts on infrastructure. Senator Lee and Senator uh, Cinema as well have a very good working relationship and so I think this is something that they can bring up directly. Anything you'd want to add to that, John? Uh, only that I, I talked to Cinema's tax staffer earlier this week to try and figure out where where uh, Senator Cinema is on reconciliation, and I've got a call set up with Senator Mansion staff in 40 minutes. So I'm, I'm going to be asking about this. I'll, I'll be sure to plug that. So this uh, webinar uh, is actually going to reside at MillCreekCommercial.com. Uh, we will send a link to everybody who has uh, participated. Uh, and if you could, uh, if you are from West Virginia or from Arizona, and you could send this link to your senator's staff, that would be awesome. Uh, and of course, if, if John or Robert could say, hey, look, take 40 minutes, just watch this presentation. Uh, and see how important 1031 exchange law is. I believe it is very difficult to, to listen to Julie Baird and not go, that's, yeah, the light just went on. This, this doesn't make sense. 
And just a quick note, the, the FEA, we did meet directly with Senator Sinema about a month ago. She's incredibly knowledgeable about 1031 exchanges and the, the value that they provide to her state. And she's definitely hearing from people on the ground on a daily, weekly basis about the importance of the provision. So um, I just agree, you know, <laughs> double down on our efforts on that front because she's definitely going to be key along with Senator Manchin. Uh, Steve is asking, is there a time frame when the vote is likely to be or when the when the bill's likely to be voted on? So we're about to have budget resolution, the resolution that sets up reconciliation that should be taking place sometime this weekend. Um, but I don't anticipate the reconciliation uh, vote that would contain this measure probably to happen until uh, after August recess. So uh, probably September. So we, okay. we, we do have some time, but you know, people are already getting locked in uh, there. There's the pieces are being put in place. And so now's the time of opportunity. Yeah. Um, Zach asked a question, uh, Julie, this may be for you. If the owner dies with multiple exchanges, do their heirs owe the capital gains from the deceased exchanges? You know, there's, there's two questions here. One happens if the bill does not pass and one will happen if the bill does pass. Julie, do you wanna answer that first? Yeah, I'll, I'll give my best stab at it. The way the law currently exists now, the heirs can continue on behalf of the estate and complete the exchange transaction to get the tax deferral. I would only be guessing if some sort of, if there's changes to step up in basis and things of that nature, if there was a death mid exchange and the heirs did not complete the exchange, they would have not the benefit of the step up in basis, so they would owe tax on the complete buildup of gain from the original basis from when the original owner purchased the original property. And, and please, others on the panel can probably speak um, in better detail than that. Would anybody like to share anything? If not, we'll go to the next question. Yeah, I think we have time for maybe two more, Spencer, given the hour. Sure. Um, Ferris asks, is there going to be a big surge in tenant in common or buy-in to purchase of LLCs to maintain the paper of ownership that makes this even less of a gain for the tax man? Well, I, let me take a stab at that yeah. because I, I deal in tenant in common. Um, uh, LLCs are not uh, going to see an increase because they're not sheltered by 1031 exchange, which is a big misconception in Washington, D.C. As, uh, as most large real estate moguls will function in single purpose LLCs and bring multiple partners together into a project, um, we do that for a project. We take our money and then we all go our own ways. Here in Utah, the Boyers and the Gardeners and the Woodberries, they'll come together and do a big project. Then we sell it, we make our profit, we split. To defer taxes, we have to continue in that LLC into another project. It's very unlikely for high net worth individuals to stay in a partnership through a single project because they have different objectives. So that's why the uber wealthy do not benefit, well, we benefit from it, but, but we're not the major benefactors of 1031 exchange. We're typically, as Julie said, one and done. We do one, we come together, we'll 1031 exchange out of it, and then we split up our proceeds, we pay our taxes, we move on. It is the small father and son, husband and wife, that stay in an LLC and exchange and exchange and exchange because they're married, they're eternal partners, they're whatever, right? That's where wealth is built in a 1031 exchange. Um, and uh, so if this happens, yeah, there'll be an increase in ticks. Uh, you'll see people sell a uh, $2 million project in four pieces. Um, I'll, I'll probably become one of the highest paid consultants in the United States as I try to figure out how to structure around this in tenant in common. Um, but uh, um, uh, yeah, that's speculation. We shouldn't answer those kind of questions, actually. But yeah, may, may I may I thank everybody for this. We're we're up against that magic hour. I've learned th three things. First of all, uh, Kevin just admitted that he's in the uber wealth, wealthy category. I don't know if he meant to say that, but no, I delighted didn't. to hear that. 
he, he's, he's practicing what he preached. Secondly, uh, business executives want consistency. They want predictability. They want to know what's happening in the future. And we appreciate so much our uh, the, the wonderful public servants, you know, uh, hearing that. Uh, and I guess the final note, a reminder to everybody on this call is one of the first things I learned in Washington is if you're not on the table, you're going to be on the menu. And so we need to be around the table when these things are happening. We need to be sharing this information with our elected representatives and their marvelous staffers going forward. Um, I want to thank everybody for their time and interest. I saw the participant list was in the, the hundreds. And this is very, very important for all of us across the country to meet with our representatives and let them know the, the real reality and the facts behind this. Kevin, would you like to do any final words before we sign off with our deep, deep thanks for everybody who participated, particularly the panelists? Well, I just express my deep gratitude and love for you and a gratitude to the staff of, uh, uh, of Senator Mitt Romney and Senator Mike Lee. Um, we are so blessed to have you uh, take the time to listen to us and to hear our concerns. And like Lou, I want to wrap up just to, to let you know that 1031 exchange transactions are transactions of choice. If you take the motivation away, the transaction stops. It doesn't happen until it becomes a transaction of need. And that may never be. So you changing 1031 exchange law does not disproportionately affect the uber wealthy. It disproportionately affects the working class. And it will not increase revenue to the federal budget. This is not a revenue offset. As I went through my scenario, and I'd love to talk with you in detail about it, John, uh, 1031 exchange is an economic driver. Thank you all, everybody who sat through this. Thank you so much. Lou, Julie, Rob, uh, Mandy, John, you're all awesome. Spencer, great job moderating. Thank you all very much. Uh, God bless America. There you go. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye Thanks, now. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Rob.